Good afternoon. Thank you. I, I hate standing behind these things. Y'all don't mind if I just step down a little bit, do you? What a wonderful crowd. Um, they say in church, whoever will, let him come, right? And whether it's 200 or 20, each who comes is significant. And I want to thank you so much. I rushed to get here. I was uh, Wednesday morning. I left here traveling to Tallahassee, and I spent all of Wednesday in and out of meetings. I forgot to eat lunch until about 5 o'clock that evening when I sat down and had lunch. And then at 4 a.m. Thursday morning, I drove from Tallahassee to Angola, Louisiana. It's a seven-hour drive from Tallahassee. And I visited the, what was once the country's most violent prison. It's a place where 6,000 men are locked up. And 85% of them are lifers. Uh, 200 years, double, triple life sentences. It sits on 18,000 acres of land and was once a plantation. And I walked death row. And I'll never forget the feeling of looking at the faces of these men whom the government and the state has decided must die for the atrocities and the heinous nature of their crimes. And I mean, it made my eyes literally tear up a little bit. Because to look at these faces of black men and Hispanic men and white men who are on death row, there were 83 of them, and they had just put one to death two weeks early, and the secretary for the Department of Corrections, Secretary LeBlanc, was describing what that one did. And then we went to another part of the prison where Pastor Sidney was about to give us an example of church. They have no gangs at Angola. Can you believe that? The only gang they have is the Bible Seminary College where inmates are pastors and they have congregations as well as deacons and trustees and ushers in jail. And these are some men who, think about it, have no hope. And Pastor Sidney had already been at Angola for 34 years of a 90-year sentence, and he was preaching the gospel. And part of what makes Angola now the most peaceful of penitentiaries, penitentiaries, is they go out to satellite prisons all across the state of Louisiana and they infect, affect other short-termers who have release dates. And the idea is to create an overall atmosphere of public safety, beginning with inside the prison so that when the short-termers get out, they have something positive that they get out with. And that kind of leads me into what I want to talk about today. We got back about 1.30 in the morning last night into Tallahassee, and I left at 8 o'clock this morning so I could get here and be here on time because you never want to miss an opportunity to share and reach and talk to folks, especially young men. Because the system is not so kind to us if we get in it. And the fact of the matter is where you are right now, this system 
the educational system, the institution of learning, this is the best system you can have and be involved in. For me, it provided a foundation of recovery. See, on March 17th, 1998, St. Patrick's Day, the day the rest of the world was getting drunk, when the employees in the detox, the treatment center that I was in, were walking around with leprechauns and the radio, newspaper, TV, all talking about St. Patty's Day, green beer, free beer, and I was in treatment, in detox, trying to figure out how to quit drinking and drugging and smoking after 15 years of smoking crack and doing dope and drinking liquor and questioning whether or not I even had a reason to live. This March 17th, 2013, I will celebrate 15 years of clean time with total integrity <laughs> through the grace of God. And the 12-step program of recovery. In fact, I just got appointed as a non-resident senior fellow at the University of Florida Drug Policy Institute associated with their addictions medicine program and my job is to travel the country speaking to lawyers and judges who have drug and alcohol problems and try to attract them to University of Florida's Drug Treatment Center. I've already spoken at the Mississippi State Bar Association, Missouri State Bar, North Carolina State Bar, and yesterday I received an invitation to speak at the Florida Bar Association July 26th and April 13th at the Louisiana State Bar Association Lawyers and Judges in Recovery. I bring this up because one of the things that helped me get clean, stay clean, and have something to fall back on was an education. I mean, can you imagine having lost everything? In fact, moving back home to St. Petersburg, November 30th, 1998, with only six months clean under my belt, no car, no driver's license. Illinois had taken it for a five-year revocation because of two DUIs in 1992 and 1995. No house, no job, nobody to believe in me but me and my four-year-old son. In fact, he's 18, going on 19. That's Daniel back there, Daniel Wave. Say hey to the folks. They were going to take him from me. My wife, my first wife divorced me, kicked me to the curb, ran over me with the bus, kept my daughters away from me for 10 years because of my addiction. My second wife died from breast cancer. I took the $80,000 life insurance policy and spent 60 of it on cocaine and alcohol over six months until they hauled me into court. And I was standing on the 23rd floor of the Daily Center, downtown Chicago, with my baby sister and my mother on one side of the courtroom, my dead wife's family on the other side of the courtroom, all of them trying to convince the judge that I didn't deserve my four-year-old, that they had to take him in order to save his life or save mine. And that judge looked at me and said, you know, Mr. Roussan, you look like a smart man. I'm going to take a recess. I'm going to give you 10 minutes. And in 10 minutes, you're going to decide whether you want Daniel or whether you want drugs. But after today, you will not have both. And your behavior gave me that power. And he ran off the bench. And at 10 minutes, I thought about my life the journey that it had taken. And I made a choice that day. I chose life. I chose to be a father to my son. And that's what helped me get on this road of, of, of recovery. And I want to talk about four basic principles today. I understand the theme today is keys to manhood. The first thing that I relied on was a relationship to other men. 
Yesterday in the welding shop at the prison, this young man was talking to us about why he's back in jail, how he became born again in jail, how he's looking forward to getting out in five years, but how he did not have a good relationship with his father. And we heard that theme over and over and over again. And I'll be honest with you, my dad, who used to be director of student, uh, student campus life on this campus years ago, who got his PhD in higher education administration, was a guidance counselor at Gibbs Junior College and then came to St. Pete College and at the time of his death was vice president uh, for student affairs at Palm Beach Junior College. All through high school and college, he and I fought. You know, old man, you can't tell me nothing, you know, and uh, I was a disappointment to him because of my behavior, because of my class clowning, because I didn't seem serious about an education or about life and living. And, but when I got to law school, it seemed like the whole relationship changed. He began to respect me. We could sit down and talk like buddies, uh, have, you know, about different things going on and the relationship. But he died of a massive heart attack two weeks before my final exams, first year of law school. And I was bitter about that for a long time because I was just then beginning to build a relationship with him. And what that did for me was it forced me to have to begin relationships with other men. Positive role models. Men who could be examples of overcoming challenges. Men who, who could be examples to me of what it meant to get my education on, to understand what it meant to get life on. And if you fall, it's not about the fall, it's about the getting up. Men who were not so uh, proud of who they were, but were humble in whose they were, so that they could show me by the demonstration of their living what manhood was all about like taking care of family, like having a hunger to succeed. You know, the, the guy I work for, John Morgan of Morgan & Morgan, wrote a book. It's called, You Can't Teach Hungry. You either have to have the passion or the desire in you to want it so bad that you're going to get it. No matter if that teacher standing in front of you, that professor has, is a nerd or has quirks, or as a policy wonk, you're going to get what they have to teach you and he's not going to stop you. And your attitude is one of hunger, a desire to make it. A right relationship with other men who if by some fate or fortune you didn't grow up with a father in the house, you know what, that's just okay. Because there are other men out there who, who want you to make it bad. I need you to make it. Because if you don't, there are institutions, there are systems designed for you if you don't. And I never want to see you there. So one of the things I want to talk about is right relationships with other men, men who are transparent enough to feel your emotion, you feel theirs in a healthy kind of way, who are not afraid to just put their arm around you and say, hey, look, this is how I did it. My life hasn't been perfect. And they still talk about me. You know, when I came back to St. Pete, somebody said, you know, Daryl, um, you ought to run for president of the NAACP. I said, run for president of NAACP? Is you crazy? <laughs> Garnell Jenkins has been president 21 years. I'm fresh home. I don't even have two years clean time under my belt. And, and the question that came back to me was, are you walking your life with integrity? And if you are, run. And so I did, I ran, and they started a smear campaign. Hey, you know that Daryl Rousson, you know, he's a, used to be a crack addict and used to drink and do, do, do. You know, if he's elected president of the NAACP, they're going to be having NA meetings and AA meetings in the headquarters. 
And when they would bring that to me, and it would hurt, the program taught me how to turn it around and say, well, go back and ask them why they haven't had them. If it truly is a community organization addressing the needs of the community. And they tried to use everything they could against me. And you know what? I beat her by 16 votes out of 400 votes cast. And for five years, I stayed president. And we had huge victories as president. Don't let the naysayers stop you. And then somebody came along and said, man, you know, you ought to run for state representative. I said, state representative? Are you kidding me? They don't have to hire an investigator. All they got to do is go under the tree at 15th Avenue South and 16th Street and talk to Pookie. <laughs> and he can tell them all they want to know about me and what I did and where I went. And, and then again, the question was asked, but are you walking with integrity? And my response was, yes, I'm, I'm trying to live beyond my past, embrace the journey, but look forward. And so I ran, and, and at the first debate at the Tiger Bay Yacht Club, I mean, Tiger Bay Club at the St. Petersburg Yacht Club on beautiful Tampa Bay, it was our first debate, and I was running against a two-term sitting city councilman who didn't have a blemish on his record and who was loved by the community and had eyed this seat and what, uh, had tried to run for it before. And then I was running against a young black preacher from Sarasota, the Reverend Charles McKenzie, a, a guy who could recite King better than King. And Bay News 9 was there filming like this, Bay News 9 filming, just taking everything. St. Pete Times, Tampa Tribune, Bradenton, Sarasota Herald Tribune, all of them were there, and 400 people. And Ernest Williams, the city councilman, stood up and got to the microphone, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm your current city councilman, and I'm running for this seat, but before I tell you about me, let me tell you about my opponent, Daryl Roussan. He's a crackhead. He's been arrested three times, twice for DUI, and he didn't file his taxes for nine years. We call that a tax cheat. And, and he just went down the list and read all my dirt. You ever had somebody do that to you? Never let you forget a mistake you might have made? And I was hot. And then he had the nerve to come sit down next to me at the head table. And I took the 12-step program of recovery. You ever had to put your religion on the shelf for a minute while you take care of something? <laughs> and I pulled them out of my heart and I put them in my back pocket. I say, y'all hold on, I'll come back and get you in a minute. <laughs> and I leaned over to him and I know we got cameras and newspaper reporters here. I can't tell you exactly what I said, but it wasn't pretty. But it was my turn to get up. And I got up and I walked to the microphone. You know how people nervous, they adjust their tie and they button their coat while they survey the audience. And, and I looked out there at these 400 people, only maybe 15 looked like me. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, everything my opponent has said about me is true. It is absolutely true. But this is a special election. And it's not special because Governor Christ has elevated Frank Peterman to become the new secretary of the Department of Juvenile Justice, vacating the seat, calling for a special election. That's not what makes it special. It's a special election because it's March 25th, 2008. And for those of you who are believers, that's two days after Easter Sunday. So we are campaigning, we are politicking, we are running through the season of Lent, the season of redemption, the season of resurrection that leads to new life. How dare a man stand up and suggest that another man can't become something because of what he used to be? That's what they did. They gave me a standing ovation and he came in third place. 
But the point I want to make is that I embraced my weakness, moved beyond it, demonstrating courage and strength in walking, which is what you have to do and what you can do and what I have to do every day, people who won't let me forget my past. Right relationship with men, concentrating on positive principles, being hungry, I mean be hungry for success. Be hungry to make it. And don't let naysayers stop you. Getting up after a fall. Those are some of the things I, I wanted to, to share with you today. And along this journey, all I can do is keep trying. When they say it, it can't be done. See, we have not had a leader of the Democratic Caucus in the Florida House from Pinellas since 1994 to 96 when it was Peter Rudy Wallace, the last Democratic Speaker of the House. When God put it on my heart in July to run for minority leader, I set about to campaign and not let anybody stop me. I wasn't the one anointed at the end of last session to become the leader in succession. And so I had to go do the, do the work. I got in my car and I drove, I put over 8,000 miles on my car between July and the November election, meeting candidates, raising money, working for campaigns, so that hopefully these people will see my work ethic and will vote me their minority leader in 2014. And you may have read some of the articles in the paper. Uh, I was running against State Representative Mia Jones out of Jacksonville, who's the special assistant to Alvin Brown, the mayor of Jacksonville, and um, she was the heir anointed. I was the one they didn't figure would get in the race. And in order to win, you need half plus one to vote for you. So I need 22 of the 44 plus one in order to be the leader in 2014. And they've thrown everything they could throw at me. I have collected 29 pledge cards. That means 29 of the 44 representatives have signed a card saying that they will vote solely for me for leader in 2014. But it ain't over yet. The current leader is upset about that and refuses to call the vote. And what I've been doing, in fact, as I drove here today, I made 37 phone calls to representatives in the caucus, making sure that I'm holding my 29. And they've tried to use everything they could. But guess what? If God don't have it for me, it's just not for me. But no one will ever say I didn't put in the work or put in the effort. And no one should ever say that about you. Even if you fail, fall still fighting. Don't give up whatever you do. Eyes front, head high to the finish. See it through. And that's what an education can do for you. That's what a drive and a hunger to succeed can do for you. And I ain't all the way made it now. I'm, I am a perfectly made, imperfect human being. And in my imperfections, I still struggle. In fact, I struggle with my boys. Can I be honest with y'all? You know, I got a 19-year-old at University of Florida who does not appreciate the fact that I'm paying cash for housing, meals, tuition, books, pocket money. 
and he just dropped dirty for a third time. They suspended him from the Sugar Bowl game. And I'm struggling with that. Why are you dancing with Satan when you know what it did in my life? But as a father, we have to love our sons. And I got five of them. And I said to my son Daniel the other day, I said, you know what, boy? I don't like either you or Evan right now. But I've got to love you until I can like you again. I don't know if some fathers in the room have ever been there. I know I took mine through that. But we are challenged to love each other and to love our boys until we can bring them to the point where they are now ready to step up and take their role. And in closing, that's why I need you. I need you to take my place. I need you to succeed. I need you to make it because there are so many out there who are counting you out like they counted me out. The stereotypes. And I need you to make it. The world is counting on you, and, and more than that, there's somebody else counting on you. A little brother, a nephew, an uncle, a father, a young man who you have yet to meet, who's going to come across your path, and you're the only one who's going to be able to talk to him and reach him because you'll know how to speak the language. I don't know it, but you do. And he's going to give you a chance to minister to him, but can you spot bull crap? Yes, I can. Can you spot bull crap? Well, guess what? So will he. And when you open your mouth to talk to him, you better talk with integrity about your experiences, your strength, and imparting hope. That's why I need you to make it. Because somebody's waiting on you. While you're sitting in this seat here today, where we have all sat, sit the seat well. Take that which applies and multiply it. Reject that which doesn't but be scrutinizing before you just reject it and keep moving forward no matter what. And when somebody invites you, no matter where you are, if they think enough of you that your life story might be a blessing to somebody, show up. Just show up and more will be revealed when you do. And so I'm sorry I didn't have a whole lot of jokes today and some humorous type stuff that might break you up. My heart is heavy. I've been on the road for three days. I haven't been home since Wednesday morning. But I had to come by here. Because if I only touch one, that one was important. And if I only inspire two, those two are important. And if I only have 10 that listened, those 10 are important. Never let anybody label you or tell you you can't do it. Ever. Ever. And when you believe in something strong enough and you're passionate about it, go for it. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You lose? Oh my God. I tell them all the time in Tallahassee, I'm here to speak my heart and my truth. 
And the worst thing that could happen is you vote me out. And that ain't so bad. I started a battle a few years ago. How many of you know about these head shops? Like Purple Haze on 34th Street and 15th Avenue South that sell every kind of crack pipe and bong and marijuana pipe and the hypocrisy to set up 100 yards from Gibbs High School where we tell students don't smoke dope, don't smoke marijuana, but they pass in a pipe store every day of the week that has every kind of water pipe you can imagine. And the law allows them to call themselves head shops selling tobacco accessories. Y'all know what I'm talking about? When's the last time you pulled up to a red light somebody was hitting a wad of tobacco out of one of them pipes? Uh, when the last time you walked in somebody's house and sitting on their coffee table or the dining room table was a water pipe that they smoking tobacco out of? A 10-year-old kid can tell you what they, so I, you know I got arrested protesting the sales of that stuff in that store and the jury convicted me and I did my probation, but we changed the law. And yesterday the Attorney General's office emailed me that we won the first round. When we passed the law in 2010 to regulate them, which was going to shut down about 75% of those stores statewide, they sued the state to delay the implementation of it. Yesterday, Judge Terry Lewis in Tallahassee ruled that the law is constitutional and can be enforced, but it might be a little too late for them. I filed a new bill this year that will prohibit the possession and sales of them anywhere in the state of Florida. If we can make you drive to Georgia to get cherry bombs, we can make you drive for a water pipe. <laughs> and I hope that by July, every store in the state of Florida, all 300 of them, will be closed permanently. Fighting the fight. When you believe in something and you're passionate enough about it, you just go for it. So thank you for receiving me today. God bless you.